well, Degenerate Pride Month is over. And I'm not going to call it just Pride Month, because using the word pride alone to signify degeneracy is subversive. And I'm not going to call it even Gay Pride Month, because using the word gay to signify degeneracy is also subversive. But Degenerate Pride Month is over, and it was exceptionally obnoxious this year. Um, with all the parades and the banana hammocks and the indecent displays and, um, you know, the grooming children for sexual predation and all of it. But I think we're actually past peak gay. You know, recent surveys have shown acceptance for gay situations and in individuals declining among the younger cohort, 18 to 34. You know, the olds are still getting more and more degenerate, but among the younger cohort, I think they've overplayed this and actually started to disgust and alienate people with their shenanigans. Um, and it's probably going to continue to get more obnoxious for some time, but I think we are past peak gay, and I think that's motivated mainly by gay fragility, where they're just kind of flailing about randomly and lashing out out of like a sense of fear and loss because they realize that, you know, straights are someday going to enjoy all of the special protections and, and rights and, and uh, privileges and entitlements that heretofore have been reserved only for grotesque degenerates. And the future is straight, and that terrifies them. But enough about that. You know, that month is over, and now it's Freedom Month. You know, this month started out with Canada Day. And I know what you're thinking, because I was skeptical too, but I actually celebrated Canada Day this year because I looked into it and I found out that Canada does have a legacy of structural racism and colonialism and imperialism and um, you know heteronormativity and patriarchy and all of these things that collectively we might call civilization. You know, Canada does have a legacy of that. Uh, they had some of that at one time, and they even have a little bit left today. And so, you know, that's something worth celebrating. And there are even some positive signs. A recent Ipsos poll found that the number of Canadians who think that racism is a big problem in Canada has fallen from 69% in 1992 to 47% today. Now, part of that is probably because Canada has gotten less racist. Um, and so, you know, normal people would tend to think if a place gets less racist, that racism has become less of a problem. And, um, you know, that's not how the social justice mindset works at all. But anyway, um, potentially a positive sign there. And I know what you're thinking, like how much racism did Canada even have? Well, there was this black woman, Viola Desmond, who was arrested in the wrong section of a segregated movie theater in Nova Scotia in 1946. And now she's on the $10 bill. But I think if you've ever been to the movies, you know that this would be a perfect place to implement segregation. And, um, and they used to have it in Nova Scotia. It wasn't legally mandated segregation, but businesses were allowed um, to segregate clientele who might alienate or annoy other sections of their clientele, and that's what they did in Nova Scotia until 1954 or so. So, um, you know, yay Canada. But right after Canada Day is July 4th, our Independence Day, the most important holiday in America and probably the world. Now, I'm not a huge fan of the American Revolution and the Enlightenment of which it was a part because I think it led us down a lot of wrong paths and all this stuff about natural rights and, and uh, you know, inalienable and all this kind of stuff and uh, all men created equal. You know, all of this stuff collectively led us down the path to egalitarian universal franchise democracy, which is pretty much you know, the second worst thing ever after communism, which is where it's inevitably going to lead. Um, so, not happy about that, but if you look at Great Britain or you look at Canada, we were already on that path, so I, I don't think we really lost anything 
through the revolution. Um, we wouldn't have done any better staying in the empire, staying in the commonwealth. And uh, we did get the second amendment, which is the one thing that's totally inarguably worthwhile about the whole business. And it's the one thing that's gonna let us fix everything else that our ancestors have done wrong up until now and save ourselves, you know, if we but use it. So um, definitely something to celebrate there, and I think setting off illegal fireworks is a great way to do it. America didn't start out as a real nation. It started out as uh, an ideological experiment. Well, several of them really. And those ideological experiments were Puritanism, which has now been mainly rolled into progressivism. You know, their belief in God is gone, but their utopian zeal and Abrahamic totalitarianism is still there, uh, merged with another now predominantly secular Abrahamic totalitarianism imported from the Russian Empire in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And the other one was classical liberalism, enlightenment classical liberalism, uh, inalienable natural rights. And look, you don't have any natural rights, certainly not inalienable ones. That's not how natural law works. The universe doesn't have your back. It doesn't mandate that you're entitled to anything, even anything so basic as protection. Um, you only have the rights you can win and the rights you can defend and the rights that you can pay for or the rights that um, someone sees fit to grant you who can win and defend or pay for them. So, you know, rights are never free. They're rarely cheap. Uh, you can probably afford more of them the better you understand natural law, you know, how things work and, and work in accordance with that rather than in opposition to that. That's really the only bearing natural law has on the question. And, um, you know, we spent the last several centuries falsifying this enlightenment conception of natural law, you know, the one America was founded on. Now, I have the profoundest respect for America's founding fathers and for what they did. They're brilliant men, but they were wrong. You know, this is where their ideas end up, here and now. Um, you're looking at it. We haven't failed the revolution. You know, we haven't failed to uphold it. The revolution failed us, so it's time to try something different. Now, the other thing America started out as was a real estate development. You know a bunch of empty land that had to be filled with British subjects, Germans, a few French, you know, Scandinavians and some various others um, in order to settle it, in order to develop it. You know, but once a development is filled, once the plots are sold off, there's a tug of war between those whose interests are best served by keeping it nice, you know, principally its residents nice and exclusive, and those who want to turn it into a slum and profit personally from imposing the bulk of the resulting costs onto others, you know, parasite slumlords, I think you know who I'm talking about. You know, but while it was being settled by Europeans, America did develop into a real nation over time, or again, you know, several of them, and these nations are worth preserving to those who compose them. Colonial history, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, westward expansion, and the early to mid 20th century all provide bodies of shared myth, legend, history, language, ancestry, experience, investment, and achievement that define overlapping national and ethnic communities. Um, you know, because there's more than one. Yankee Land and Dixie, not the same nation. So, ethnogenesis the birth of a nation was well underway by the mid 20th century, uh, but it was eventually eclipsed and interrupted by a new ideal and a new definition of America uh, as a nation of immigrants and a set of abstract, impractical, and deracinated ideals that effectively mandate America become a flop house for the world's wretched refuse. You know, the left celebrates these as core American values, 
which is pretty funny considering that engram searches will show that hardly anyone was writing about these things before the 1960s. So, um, you know, they're not really that core. These are values that have eclipsed core American values, you know, as part of a, a plan to replace America's traditional American population. Uh, but still, to this day, over 20 million people self-identify their ethnicity as American, you know, in, as opposed to German or British or something else. That's their ancestry or their ethnicity that they report on the census. And I predict that that number is only going to grow over time. You know, and the cradle of American ethnogenesis seems to be in Appalachia and the Upland South. I can virtually guarantee anybody in those areas who identifies as American first and only, that is, an American by blood, is not a grotesque, coastal, butt-buggering, urbanite pervert, nor a, you know, like, le 56% mystery meat. Most of those people loathe and detest America to their core and would never identify as American without some kind of other qualification that effectively supersedes it. So, um, you know, the choice is ours now. Whether the America of the future will be controlled and inhabited by American, Americans and American nations, or by foreigners and foreign nations. In the last several decades can be undone. In 2013, the Dominican Republic erased birthright citizenship and revoked passports from Haitians going back to 1929. So we can do this. We can take back America.